Och så finns det lagar på det. Just one second, please. All right, so we are back. Okay. So this is as far as your spirometry is concerned, and we discussed all the long volumes and capacities. Class till be, will be till 10 p.m. You, um, 10 p.m. Akash, that's what you think. Yeah, next week also I'll be taking the class. Okay. All right, so this is as far as your um, vital capacity and forced vital capacity is the same. Class till 10 p.m. Okay, we'll take another break at 8 o'clock. Okay, right, so push your bus. So we'll do that. All right, next let's go on to um, <laughs> now, uh, which of the following lung volumes and capacities, which of the following cannot be measured, which cannot be measured by routine spirometry, which cannot be measured by routine spir spirometry? This cannot be measured by routine spirometry. Which of the following lung volumes and capacities cannot be measured by routine spirometry? This is residual volume, functional residual capacity, and total lung capacity. All of these cannot be measured by routine spirometry. What is happening? Okay. All right, so this is, um, it can not be measured by routine spirometry, residual volume, functional residual capacity, and total lung capacity. These are the lung volumes and capacities which cannot be measured by routine spirometry. Okay. Now, FRC, for the measurement of FRC, you have three techniques. You have three techniques for the measurement of FRC. And what ERV plus residual volume, and which are the three techniques for the measurement of FRC? This is going to be the nitrogen washout method. Nitrogen washout method. Number two, you have what is known as the helium dilution technique. Right? Helium dilution technique. This is the nitrogen washout method and the helium dilution technique. And three, you have what is known as the whole body plethysmography whole body plethysmography. This is what is uh, what is your uh, techniques which are which are for the measurement of FRC. There are three techniques, nitrogen washout method, helium dilution technique, and the whole body plethysmography. Yes. So uh, remember, the uh, ERV you can get by routine spirometry. By spirometry, you can get ERV. Yes. And so then, therefore, you can calculate the RV. What is RV? RV will be FRC minus the ERV. FRC by one of the three techniques, nitrogen washout, helium dilution, or whole body plethysmography, and ERV by spirometry. That is how you can get RV. RV is an indirect measurement, right? This is an indirect measurement. Okay. So this is indirect measurement. So FRC minus the ERV. Residual volume is FRC minus the ERV. Okay. Now, uh, the next important point as far as um, uh, this is concerned is what do you understand by? No, Adarsh KV, this is nitrogen washout is different from Fowler's. What was Fowler's? Fowler's was 
single breath nitrogen analysis single breath nitrogen analysis uh, af, uh, that was uh, the nitrogen analysis in the expired air after a single deep breath of 100% oxygen. In this case, it is a nitrogen washout. You keep giving him 100% oxygen, nitrogen in the expired air is zero. So that is called nitrogen washout. So there's a difference. Nitrogen is used for both anatomic dead space as well as for FRC, but the techniques are completely different. Okay. Clinical application, FRC key measurement. Right, FRC measurement is the uh, is the uh, is the clinical application. Yes, of course, I agree with Suprabha. There is no need. There is no sorry here, Memansa. Sorry for what? Nothing. What is plethysmography? Plethysmography is the technique which is used for measurement of FRC. See, I cannot go into the details of these techniques here because it is like I told you, not a must know. So what I do is all these details of these um, uh, either we take up in the DVT or somewhere, but not in the regular class. Because in the regular class, our main aim is to, uh, like I said, cover all the must know topics. So as far as you know the names, which is important, nitrogen washout, helium dilution, whole body plethysmography. Yes, uh, whole body plethysmography, I normally take up in the DVT session or in an AIMS discussion session. Yes, so this is as far as your, uh, the calculation of FRC is concerned. Okay, measurement RC is concerned. Now, the um, next important point here is what do you understand by timed vital capacity? Naman, what was 2700, not 27,000, 2700? That is, see, FRC at the, that is the lung volume at the end of a normal expiration is 20, that is FRC, yes? If I take a tidal inspiration, the lung volume increases to 2700 ml in the case of males and 2300 ml in the case of females. So it's FRC plus tidal volume. No name for it. This is just FRC plus tidal volume. That's, that is the one. This is 2700 ml in the case of males and 2300 ml in the case of females. Yes. Okay. So now. Um, now, what do you understand by the timed vital capacity? Shambhavi, too short a break, you had to sit inside the house and make a cup of tea for yourself. No? So what, how, what different 10 minutes is more than sufficient? You're not going to go out of the house to have a cup of tea, right? Okay. Timed vital capacity. Now, now, what is timed vital capacity? This is FEV1, FEV2, and FEV3, right? FEV3. What is FEV1? This is the forcefully expired, forcefully expired volume of air, forcefully expired at the end of, at end of one second, at the end of one second, at the end of one second, two second, and three seconds. This is what is known as FEV1, FEV2, and FEV3. Forcefully expired volume of air at the end of one second, two second, three seconds. See, what is the difference between vital capacity and the timed vital capacity? Let's have a look. Difference between vital capacity and timed vital capacity. This is, now for instance, this is the tidal volume here. Yes. Now, if I want vital capacity, I ask my patient to take a maximum inspiration followed by maximum expiration. This is the volume of air which is expired forcefully after a forceful inspiration. This is known as the forced vital capacity or simply the vital capacity. Forced vital capacity or vital capacity. Please remember the difference. What is the difference? I'm trying to discuss with you what is the difference between vital capacity and timed vital capacity. While measuring forced vital capacity, I was only interested in the volume. It says, what is the definition of forced vital capacity? Volume of air expired forcefully after a forceful inspiration. What is timed vital capacity? Now, while measuring timed vital capacity, I ask the subject to increase. I ask the subject to take a maximum inspiration followed by a maximum expiration, but the maximum expiration has to be done as fast as possible. Maximum expiration has to be done as fast as possible. 
Yes. This is the tidal volume which is going on. You ask your patient, take a maximum inspiration, followed by a maximum expiration, but the expiration has to be done as fast as possible. Why as fast as possible? Because you have to bring time into the picture. Yes. Now, when do I start measuring the time? From the point of maximum inspiration, when he's just about to expire forcefully, I start to measure the time. So time is on the x-axis, time is on the horizontal axis, yes? And let's say this is one second, right? Time is on the horizontal axis, so this is one second, this is two seconds, this is three seconds. Now, what is now what is FEV1? Let's try and see that. What is FEV1? FEV1, like I said, is the forcefully expired volume of air at the end of one second. So we will extrapolate this one second and measure. This is the forcefully expired volume of air at the end of one second. This is known as FEV1. And normally we express FEV1 as a ratio. It is expressed as a ratio of the total vital capacity. A normal FEV1 by FVC ratio. A normal FEV1 by FVC ratio is 0 0.7 to 0 0.8, which is 70 to 80 percent. 70 to 80 percent. If I want to know FEV2, I will extrapolate this two seconds over here to map to meet the graph. This is going to be the volume of air expired at the end of two seconds, right? FEV1 at the end of one second and FEV2 at the end of two seconds. And a normal FEV2 by the FVC ratio. This is 0 0.9 or 90%. This is FEV2 by FVC ratio. This is 0 0.9 or 90 percent what is fev3 this is at the end of three seconds fev3 this is at the end of three seconds this is going to be at the end of three seconds this is fev3 right fev3 again how much is the normal fev3 by fvc ratio that is almost 100 percent or 0.97 to 0 0.98 or 97 to 98 percent. This is how you will measure the timed vital capacity. Forcefully expired volume of air at the end of one second, two second, three seconds. You express this as a ratio of the total vital capacity. FEV1 by FEVC ratio is 0 0.7 to 0.8 or 70 to 80 percent. FEV2 by FEC ratio is 0 0.9 or 90 percent. FEV3 by FVC ratio is 0.97 to 0.98 or 97 to 98%, right? So this is as far as your uh, time. What is the difference between vital capacity and timed vital capacity? In timed vital capacity, you're bringing time into the picture. FVC is only the volume. Volume of air, what was FVC? Volume of air expired forcefully at the after a forceful inspiration. In timed vital capacity, when you're measuring time vital capacity, you have to tell your patient maximum inspiration followed by maximum expiration, but the maximum expiration has to be done as fast as possible. You're bringing time into the picture. Clinical application of, of the time vital capacity, this is to distinguish between, to distinguish between obstructive lung disease, to distinguish between obstructive lung disease and the restrictive lung disease. The time vital capacity will be used to distinguish between obstructive and the restrictive lung disease. Obstructive and restrictive lung disease. In obstructive lung, lung disease, FEV1 by FVC ratio is decreased. In restrict, restrictive lung disease, FEV1 by FVC ratio is normal to increased, right? In to distinguish between obstructive and restrictive lung disease. In FEV1 by FEC ratio is, um, is reduced in obstructive lung disease. Yes, uh, uh, reduced in obstructive lung disease. How is it going to be reduced? Now the numerator decreases more than the denominator. FEV1 
the decrease in FEV1 is more than the decrease in FEC. FEC will be normal to decreased, whereas FEV1 is decreased more. Numerator decreases more than the denominator. Then the ratio will reduce. In restrictive lung disease, FEV1 and FEC are reduced to the same extent or FEC reduces more than the FEV1. If they are reduced to the same extent, ratio will remain normal. If the decrease in FEC is more than the decrease in FEV1, ratio will increase. So it's all relative, right? In obstructive lung disease, the ratio, the decrease in FEV1 is more than the decrease in FEC. In restrictive lung disease, the reduction in FEC is more than the reduction in FEV1. Please remember, in obstructive lung disease, rates are affected more than volumes. Rates are affected more than volumes. Rates are affected more than volumes. FEV1 is a rate time. FEC is a volume. Numerator is affected more than the denominator. Obstructive lung disease, a simple way, there is a plastic pipe. If you place your foot on that pipe, flow rate will reduce. So obstructive lung disease, flow rates will reduce. Rates are affected more than volumes. FEV1 is a rate. FEC is a volume. Right? So rates are affected more than the volumes. Numerator is affected more than the denominator. So the ratio reduces. In restrictive lung disease, restrictive lung disease, the volumes are affected more than the rates. Volumes are Volumes are affected more than the rates. It is restriction in expansion. Restriction in expansion, like pulmonary fibrosis, right? That is a restrictive lung disease. Restriction in expansion, pulmonary fibrosis. Now, volume is affected more than the rate. That means FEC is affected more than the FEV1. Denominator is affected more than the numerator. So the restrictive lung disease, the FEV1 by FEC ratio increases. Example of restrictive lung disease, pulmonary fibrosis, interstitial lung disease, right? Obstructive lung disease. What are the examples of obstructive lung disease? For example, bronchial asthma, obstruction to flow, bronchial asthma or emphysema. Akshata? I'm trying to tell you in obstructive lung disease, the numerator is decreased more than the denominator. So the ratio will ultimately reduce. In restrictive lung disease, FEV1 by FEC ratio is normal to increased. How does it become normal if the decrease in numerator and decrease in denominator is equal? The ratio will remain the same. If the, how will the ratio increase if the decrease in the denominator, FEC, is more than the decrease in FEV1? One arrow means slight decrease. Two arrows means greater decrease. In obstructive lung disease, numerator is showing you two arrows. Larger decrease in the numerator lesser decrease in the denominator. So the ratio will reduce. It is always relative, right? right? So this is obstructive and restrictive lung disease. This is the significance of the... Um, see, please remember that the um, rates are affected more than volumes in obstruction. In obstructive it, the rates are affected. It is like the simple thing I told you, if there is a plastic pipe, water is flowing through that pipe, you put your foot, obstruct it, there is going to be a decrease in the flow rate of water. So that is obstructive lung disease. Rates are affected more than volume. FEV1, please remember what is a rate. Rate means it has, it is per unit time. FEV1 is a rate. FEC is a volume. Rates are affected more than volumes. Numerator is affected more than the denominator. In restrictive lung disease, restriction in expansion, the lung is not able to expand completely. So that means volumes are affected more than the rates. So FEC, the denominator is affected more than the numerator. So the ratio increases. Is that okay? Is that okay? 
somebody who was complaining about not being able to write are you okay with it are you okay with it All right, so this is obstructive and restrictive lung disease. All right, let's now go on to ventilation. Ah, beta, um, uh, please remember obstructive lung disease, FVC is normal to reduced. In some patients, it may be normal, in some may be reduced. Okay, all right. Now let's see, let's have a look at ventilation. Let's have a look at ventilation. Now, the first important pressure for ventilation, this is known as the intrapleural pressure. Intrapleural pressure or also known as the pleural pressure or also known as the intrathoracic pressure. Intrathoracic pressure or also known as the esophageal pressure, right? Intrathoracic pressure or also known as the esophageal pressure. Esophageal pressure, intrapleural pressure or the pleural pressure or the intrathoracic pressure or the esophageal pressure. This is the same thing, just synonyms of the same pressure. Now, we know that there are two layers of the pleura. There is a parietal pleura and there is a visceral pleura. Yes, there is a parietal pleura and there is a visceral pleura and between the two layers of pleura, there is a potential space. And the pressure in this space, and the pressure in this space, And the pressure in this space, there is a potential space here and the pressure in this space is negative with respect to atmosphere. The pressure between the two layers of pleura, there is a visceral pleura, there is a parietal pleura, there is a potential space between the two layers of pleura and the, the space in this, uh, the, the pressure in this space is negative with respect to atmosphere. Now, what do you mean by negative with respect to atmosphere, right? Now, if I say that this pressure is minus 2.5 millimeters of mercury with respect to atmosphere, what does this mean? This means that if the atmospheric pressure is 760, at sea level, the atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. With this negative with respect to atmosphere means it is 2.5 millimeters lower than the atmospheric pressure. In other words, this will be 70, 77.5, uh, uh, 757.5 millimeters of mercury. Have you understood? It is lower than the atmospheric pressure. It is not an actual negative pressure. It is minus 2.5 millimeters of mercury with respect to atmosphere, right? Whatever is the atmospheric pressure. Supposing, let's say the atmospheric pressure is 500. Then this pressure will be 497.5 millimeters mercury. It is minus 2.5 with respect to atmosphere. Plural pressure. We are talking about intrapleural pressure or also known as the pleural pressure or also known as the intrathoracic pressure or also you can use it, you can use, you can measure it as the esophageal pressure. Esophageal pressure is similar to pleural pressure. You cannot measure the pleural pressure. You cannot puncture the pleura and measure the pressure. So what you do is you measure the esophageal pressure. Esophage, esophageal pressure is close to the pleural pressure. So this is your esophageal pressure. Manu, I hope you are, you are right. Now, like I said, this is negative with respect to atmosphere. Negative with respect to atmosphere. Esophageal pressure is used to measure the pleural pressure. Right? It is similar to the pleural pressure. You cannot measure the pleural pressure directly. You can't, you'll have to puncture the pleural space otherwise. Yes. 
Now, this is negative with respect to atmosphere. So that means that if there is, supposing there is a puncture of the pleural space, due to anything, there is a puncture of the pleural space, air will come from outside to inside. When, because air always moves from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. So air will come from outside to inside till the pressures are the same on both sides. And when pressures are same, so same on both sides, we, we call it zero millimeters. Zero millimeters of mercury with respect to atmosphere. Right? We call it zero millimeters of mercury with respect to atmosphere. Okay? Please remember if there is a puncture, puncture of the pleural space, the pressure air will come from outside to inside till the air, till the pressures, atmospheric pressure and the pleural pressure is the same. And then we say pleural pressure is zero millimeters of mercury. Right? Now, uh, why is this pressure negative? Why is pleural pressure negative? Why is pleural pressure negative with respect to atmosphere? Why is the pleural pressure negative with respect to atmosphere? Number one, the reason why it's negative with, two, with respect to atmosphere is this is because stick recoil of the lungs. Elastic recoil of the lungs. Elastic recoil of the lungs and elastic recoil of the chest wall. Elastic recoil of the lungs and elastic recoil of the chest wall. These are two opposing forces. These are two opposing forces, elastic recoil of the lungs and elastic recoil of the chest wall, well, these are two opposing forces. See, what do we mean by that? What is elastic recoil? Elastic recoil is if you pull a rubber band, a rubber band is an elastic structure. You pull a rubber band, you will generate a tension in the rubber band. You leave it, it will go back to its original size and shape. Now, lungs are an elastic structure. Chest wall is also an elastic structure. The elastic recoil of the lung, elastic recoil of the lung is towards the inside. The elastic fibers of the lungs are so arranged that their tendency to recoil is towards the inside. And the elastic fibers in the chest wall are so arranged that their tendency to recoil is towards the outside. These are two opposing forces. They are pulling the pool space in the opposite direction. And that is what is creating the negative pressure in the pool space. Elastic recoil of lung and elastic recoil of chest wall. These are opposing forces. They are pulling the pool space in the opposite direction. See, I can um, uh, the closest I can come to describing this pressure is Closest I can come to describing this pressure is, um, uh, uh, for example, if you remember first year of physiology and you remember your hematology lab, yes? Now, we used glass slides. There were two glass, we, we used glass slides for peripheral smear, right? And a very common experience, you reach the lab, your lab technician has washed the slides and kept them in a tray. You pick up two slides. They are wet, stuck to each other. If you remember, it was very easy to move the slides like this. This is exactly what is happening in the pleura. Visceral pleura, parietal pleura, thin layer of pleural fluid, they're stuck to each other like this. If you remember, you tried to separate the two slides. You remember the feeling of a negative pressure? That is exactly what is happening over here. The visceral pleura is being pulled in one direction and the parietal pleura is being pulled in the opposite direction. This is creating a negative force in the pleural space, right? This is what is known as elastic recoil of lungs and elastic recoil of chest wall. These are opposing forces, right? These are opposing forces. And let's see a clinical application here, yes? Let's see, uh, for example, let's see what happens in the case of emphysema. In emphysema, there is a destruction of the elastic, elastic fibers of the lungs. Elastic fibers of the lungs are going to be destroyed, isn't it? 
elastase enzyme causes destruction of the elastic fibers in the lungs. So that means what will happen to the lung recoil force? There is going to be a decrease in the lung recoil force. There is a decrease in the lung recoil force. This recoil force will now reduce. So that means if the lung recoil force decreases, there is now a relative increase in the chest wall recoil force. There is a relative increase in the chest wall recoil force. So what is the shape of the chest? What is the shape of the chest in emphysema? Barrel chest, barrel shaped chest, because the elastic recoil of the chest wall, which is towards the outside is relatively more. So this gives rise to a barrel shaped chest. This gives rise to a barrel shaped chest, right? There is a decrease in the lung recoil force, which causes a relative increase in the chest wall recoil force, giving rise to a barrel shaped chest, right? So this is as far as what happens in emphysema. This is what, what, we, what we understand. What is the significance of this negative force in the total space? Negative force in the total space. Why is it negative? Because the chest wall, the lung recoil force and the chest wall recoil force, these are opposing forces. Now, another important point here is at FRC. And what is FRC? We've already discussed functional residual capacity, lung volume at the end of a normal expiration. At FRC, the lung recoil, lung recoil, is equal and opposite to the chest wall recoil. Both of these are equal and opposite, right? The lung recoil is equal and opposite to the chest wall recoil force. Both the forces are equal and opposite to each other. Both, the, both of them are um, uh, equal and opposite to each other, yes? Um, FRC is also known as, FRC is also known as the relaxation volume of the lungs. This is known as the relaxation volume of the lungs. Neat question. What is the relaxation of the volume of the lungs? This is FRC. Why is it known as relaxation volume? Because at this, at FRC, all muscles are relaxed, including diaphragm. And at this point, Lung recoil and chest wall recoil are equal and opposite to each other. Okay? So this is what is meant by lung recoil and the chest wall recoil force. Right? So this is uh, this is what um, this um, see another very interesting clinical application of this of this negative force. Let's have a look at that. And that is, let's see what happens in a pneumothorax or a large pleural effusion. In a pneumothorax, right, or a, uh, a large pleural effusion. Yes. Now, now you have fluid or air in the pleural space. Once you have fluid, in the pleural space, this link between the two forces, now there is something which is, has broken that link between the chest wall recoil and the lung recoil. Yes? So, lung recoil is no longer opposed by, this is no longer opposed by the chest wall recoil. This is no longer opposed by the chest wall Recoil. So what is the most common complication that you see in a pneumothorax or in a large pleural effusion? There is going to be a collapse. The lung recoil force is directed towards the inside. Now because there is water or fluid or air between the lung recoil and the chest recoil force, the link between these two forces is gone. So now the lung recoil is no longer being opposed by the chest wall recoil. So collapse becomes extremely common. Yes. Collapse is going to be seen in, uh, collapse is going to be seen in, like I said, uh, in a pneumothorax or a large pleural fusion. Okay. So this is the significance of a, uh, significance of a,
of this lung recoil and the elastic recoil of lungs and chest wall. At FRC, like I said, lung recoil is equal and opposite to the chest wall recoil. So FRC also known as the relaxation volume of the lungs. The second important, the second important um, reason for this negative force, negative pressure in the breathing space, this is no Jabira. FRC means lung volume at the end of normal expiration. Okay. That is what is meant by no, not after inhaling. If you after exhaling FRC, you will reach residual volume. Sorry. Okay. Now, the second reason why there is going to be a negative pressure in the global space, this is also because of a continuous drainage. Continuous drainage of the lymphatics. Continuous drainage of the pleural fluid into the lymphatics. Pleural fluid into the lymphatics. There is a continuous drainage of the pleural fluid into the lymphatics, right? Out of the two, which is a more important reason? The first one. First one, elastic recoil. Why is there going to be a negative pressure in the pleural space? Because these two forces are opposing. There is also drainage into the lymphatics, but this is uh, my major reason is the first one. Okay. Okay. Pneumothorax. Yeah. Okay. yeah, Jabira after exhaling tidal volume. Okay. Now, this is as far as your, um, the negative pressure in the pleural space. Now let us see, now let us see what happens to the pleural pressure during respiration. Changes in the pleural pressure during respiration. During a tidal respiration. Changes in the pleural pressure during a tidal respiration. Let's try and see that. Changes in the pleural pressure in, tide, in tidal respiration. Okay. Now, if this is the midline here, this is inspiration and expiration. Sayantani Pal, FRC may diaphragm is contracted, relaxed, which is the main muscle of tidal respiration. Diaphragm now. Diaphragm is relaxed at FRC at the end of tidal expiration. Yes. <laughs> now let's see if this is the tidal volume here. This is tidal volume 500 ml. Five hundred ml. Yes. This is the. Now let us try and see what are the changes in the pleural pressure during a tidal respiration. Tidal respiration means now this is a volume of air inspired or expired. This is five hundred ml. We inspire five hundred ml during the tidal inspiration. Expire five hundred ml during a tidal uh, tidal expiration. Okay. Now the pleural pressure. Pleural pressure in millimeters of mercury. Pleural pressure in millimeters of mercury. With respect to atmosphere, total pressure in millimeters of mercury with respect to atmosphere. Now, this is minus 2.5 millimeters. I've already told you this is negative with respect to atmosphere. Two reasons elastic recoil of the lungs and elastic recoil of the chest wall. These are two opposing forces, right? That is responsible for a negative pressure in the pleural space. Okay. Now, at the start, at the end of a tidal expiration and before you start your inspiration, this pressure is minus 2.5 millimeters of mercury. Now, my next important point is, which is the main muscle of a tidal respiration? Main muscle of tidal respiration is diaphragm. During inspiration, the diaphragm contracts and moves downwards. So if I look at it from the uh, of a sort of a side view of the lung, this is the diaphragm here. This is the chest wall. This is parietal pleura, chest wall is lined by the parietal pleura, visceral pleura on the surface of the lungs. This is from the side. 
Now, during inspiration, during inspiration, the diaphragm will contract and move downwards. Diaphragm contracts and moves downwards. Yes, diaphragm contracts and moves downwards. If diaphragm contracts and moves downwards, what will happen to the diaphragmatic pleura? Diaphragmatic pleura will also move downwards. What will happen to the volume of the pleural space? There is an increase in the volume of the pleural space. And if there is an increase in the volume, remember this is an enclosed space. If there is an increase in the volume of pleural space, what will, pleural space, what will happen to the pressure? There is now a decrease in the pleural pressure. So during the tidal inspiration, the diaphragm is contracting and moving downwards. Diaphragmatic pleura is also moving downwards. This increases the volume of the pleural space and which reduces the pressure. Pressure is inverse to the volume. As the volume of the pleural space increases, pressure decreases, and this reaches a negative pressure of minus 6. During expiration, now the reverse is going to happen. Right? During, this was during inspiration, diaphragm contracts and moves downwards, volume of pleural space increases, decrease in pleural pressure. The pleural pressure now from minus 2.5 becomes more negative and becomes minus 6. Now let us try and see what happens during expiration. During expiration, the diaphragm will relax. During expiration, the diaphragm relaxes and moves upwards. If it moves upwards, now there is now going to be a reduction. If it moves upwards, there is now a reduction in the volume of the pleural space. And what will happen to the pressure? Pressure will increase. Yes. So the pressure increases and goes back to minus 2.5 millimeters of mercury. From minus 2.5 at the end of inspiration, during inspiration, it becomes more negative and reaches minus 6 at the end of inspiration. During expiration, this pressure becomes less negative and at the end of expiration, is this is minus 2.5 millimeters of mercury. From less negative to more negative, back to less negative. Have you understood? This is what is going to happen to the pleural pressure. But remember, it always remains negative. It always remains negative. And this negative pressure is very important because it helps to inflate the lungs. I feel this Surrounding pressure is becoming more, is more negative. It helps to inflate the lungs. So from less negative to more negative and back to less negative. This is during the tidal respiration. Yes. Now, this is when I do a forceful inspiration. Forceful inspiration, I'm going to use the accessory muscles of respiration which are the accessory muscles of respiration, intercostals, abdominals, sternocleidomastoid. When I use my accessory muscles of inspiration, volume of the pleural space increases much more. So pressure will reduce even further. Pressure instead of minus 6 will become minus 10, minus 15, minus 20. It can become as low as minus 30. That is true. Stronger the inspiratory effort, Stronger the inspiratory effort, more negative. Hey, Shrishti Agarwal, air is not entering into the plural space. Air is entering into the lungs, not into the plural space. Plural space is surrounding the lungs. Shrishti Agarwal, where is air entering? When we breathe, it goes to the lungs. It goes to the plural space. Okay. Stronger the inspiratory effort, stronger the inspiratory effort, more negative, more negative is will be the pleural pressure. Stronger the inspiratory effort, larger increase in pleural volume, more negative will be the pleural pressure. Okay. Jitna strong inspiratory effort. Jitni accessory muscles of inspiration part use karenge, isn't it? When you do a stronger inspiratory effort, you will use your accessory muscles. Major muscle of tidal diaphragm. Stronger inspiratory effort is stronger inspiratory effort means this is going to be uh, more negative will be the pleural pressure, right? 
jitna volume volume of fluid space will increase much more and pressure will reduce please remember the pleural space is what is pleural how is the pleural space formed it is a double layered jacket there is no communication with the atmosphere it's a double layered jacket which surrounds the lungs remember your embryology how the lung grows in the pleural uh, in the pleural space isn't it <gasps> lalit jain all oh, present in the pleural space is dead space no beta increase in volume how does it lead to a reduce in reduction pressure boils lana beta temperature pressure and volume pressure is inverse to the volume more the volume less the pressure less the volume more the pressure okay okay the body be okay okay so this is the changes in the pleural pressure from more negative and back to less negative but the important thing is the it always remains negative right it always stronger the inspiratory effort more negative will be the pleural pressure from minus 2.5 it can become minus 10 minus 15 minus 18 minus 20 it all depends upon the inspiratory effort larger increase in pleural pleural volume Uh, larger the increase in pleural volume lower will be the pressure right okay this is okay ye uh, now let me just let me just take this little experiment which you have all done in school yes let me let me discuss this this is an inverted bell jar this is an inverted bell jar there is a rubber stopper here there is a balloon here and there is a rubber diaphragm this is a rubber diaphragm remember this little experiment this will tell you there is a rubber diaphragm here right now if i pull this rubber diaphragm if i pull this rubber diaphragm what is happening to the volume here volume of the bell jar is increasing pressure is reducing so what will happen to the balloon the balloon automatically increases in volume something like this is happening the balloon is the lung and the remaining bell jar is the pleural space so if i increase the pleural space the pressure will reduce yes pressure which is surrounding the lungs will reduce and it will cause the lungs to expand this pleural pressure has to be negative have you understood you remember this little experiment that you've done in school both but it is negative with respect to atmosphere okay negative with respect to atmosphere chal so this is your pleural pressure change now the important point which i wanted to discuss with you is in terms of millimeters of mercury in terms of millimeters of mercury the pleural pressure uh, in the terms of centimeters of water pleural pressure is minus 4 centimeters of water at the start of inspiration minus 4 centimeters of water and at the what do you want there okay so like i said in um, in terms of uh, centimeters of water we can measure pressure in centimeters of water so at the start of inspiration the pressure is minus 4 centimeters of water and the end of tidal inspiration it becomes minus 9 centimeters of water it has to become more negative right in terms of millimeters of mercury minus 2.5 to minus 6 back to minus 2.5 in terms of centimeters of water minus 4 and uh, becomes more negative to minus 9 and back to minus 4 okay so this is um this is as far as your changes in pleural pressure is concerned answer this question pleural pressure at the start of inspiration pleural pressure at the start of inspiration is minus 4 centimeters of water minus 4 centimeters of water during inspiration during inspiration pleural pressure is pleural pressure is 
minus 7.5 centimeters of water plus 7.5 centimeters of water minus 2.5 centimeters of water or plus 2.5 centimeters of water. Bolo. A, B, C, or do the total pressure at the start of inspiration is minus four centimeters of water. Please remember, I'm talking now in centimeters of water. Earlier, I told you in millimeters of mercury. You must know both the values. Right? During inspiration, plural pressure will be plural pressure is. Tell me. Plural pressure is minus. It has to become more negative. Plural pressure during inspiration has to become more negative. From minus four, it will become more negative. It will be minus 7.5 millimeters of mercury. This is the important point. Stronger the inspiratory effort, more negative the plural pressure. So this is as far as your plural pressure is concerned, right? Less negative at the start of inspiration, more negative at the end of inspiration, back to less negative at the end of expiration. Now, the, um, the next important pressure that I'm going to discuss with you is what do you understand, understand by the airway pressure? Airway pressure or also known as the alveolar pressure. Airway pressure or also known as the alveolar pressure. Airway pressure or the alveolar pressure. Let's discuss this. Right? Airway pressure or the alveolar pressure. Or this is also known as the intrapulmonary pressure. Intrapulmonary pressure. You must know the synonyms because different questions use different terms. Yes. So airway pressure or the alveolar pressure or the intra, intrapulmonary pressure. Now, if I look at the cross section of the lungs, Yes, cross section of the lungs. I'm just doing a diagrammatic representation. Airway, alveoli. Okay. Now, during inspiration, during inspiration, the airway pressure should be lower than the atmospheric pressure, isn't it? During inspiration, airway airway pressure should be lower than the atmospheric pressure. So only then air will come from outside to inside. During inspiration, airway pressure should be lower than the atmospheric pressure and air will therefore come from outside to inside and air will continue to come from outside to inside till the pressure on both sides is the same. Yes. During expiration, the airway pressure should be higher than the outside pressure. Then air will go from inside the lungs to outside. Now, this is another pressure which I'm talking about, which is called the airway pressure, alveolar pressure or the intrapulmonary pressure. Right? Now, the um, like I said, airway pressure during inspiration, during inspiration, airway pressure should be lower than atmospheric pressure. And during expiration, during inspiration, airway pressure should be lower than airway pressure should be lower than atmospheric pressure, right? It should be lower than the atmospheric pressure. Then air will come from outside to inside the lungs. And during expiration, the airway pressure, during expiration, the airway pressure is higher than airway pressure, is higher than the atmospheric pressure because only then the airway should then the air will go from inside to outside the lungs so this is a very basic principle because air always moves from higher to lower pressure from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure so let's see what will happen to the airway pressure or the alveolar pressure or the intrapulmonary pressure during inspiration and expiration let's see this here this is inspiration here this is expiration so this is a tidal inspiration and a tidal expiration. Tidal volume, 500 ml is inspired and this is 500 ml is expired. Yes, this is a tidal inspiration and a tidal expiration. Okay, and this is your tidal volume, which is 500 ml. Okay. Now the airway pressure, airway pressure is also with respect to atmosphere. Airway pressure in millimeters of mercury also with respect to atmosphere. 
in millimeters of mercury with respect to atmosphere. Now, at the end of end of expiration, before inspiration starts, the pressure is zero. The pressure is zero. There is no airflow. When the pressure is zero, means the airway pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure. There is no airflow. Okay. So let's try and see what happens during ex during inspiration first. What happens during inspiration? Right. Now, during inspiration. The pressure surrounding the lungs, that is the pleural pressure, that has become more negative. When it becomes more negative, it tends to cause an expansion of the lungs. Remember that bell jar experiment I told you. If the pressure which is surrounding the lungs, the pleural volume increases, pressure reduces, pressure surrounding the lungs is becoming more negative, it tends to cause an expansion of the lungs. When it tends to cause an expansion of the lungs, the airway and the alveoli, they tend to increase in volume. If they increase in volume, the pressure reduces. Now the pressure reduces and becomes minus one millimeter of mercury with respect to atmosphere. When I say minus one millimeter of mercury with respect to atmosphere, that means the pressure becomes 759. Outside 760, inside becomes 750. The moment it becomes 7 air will start moving from outside to inside. And when air starts moving from outside to inside, this minus one pressure will start rising. And the moment it becomes zero, what is zero? Zero means it is equal to the outside pressure. When it becomes equal to the outside pressure, airflow will stop. End of inspiration. This was zero before we started inspiration. Early stages of inspiration, it became minus one, slightly lower than atmospheric pressure. Air comes from outside to inside. This pressure rises. Airway pressure at the end of inspiration will be equal to the atmospheric pressure. And this touches zero. This is the airway pressure that we are talking about. The During expiration, during expiration, now the reverse will happen. During expiration, let's see this. During expiration, again, a cross-section of the lungs here. Okay. A cross-section of the lungs like that. During expiration, the diaphragm is moving outwards and uh, upwards and compressing the lungs. When it compresses the lungs, it reduces the volume of the airway and the alveoli. Pressure increases. Pressure increases. Pressure increases and becomes slightly higher than the atmospheric pressure, which is plus one. The moment the airway pressure becomes plus one, air starts flowing, moving out of the alveoli into the atmosphere. So what will happen to the airway pressure? Airway pressure begins to reduce and at the end of expiration, it touches zero. This is what is going to happen to the airway pressure. What is going to happen to me? See, this is a diagrammatic representation of the lung. This is the airway and the alveoli. This is the airway here and this is the alveoli. Right? The uh, alveolus. During inspiration, pressure surrounding the lungs is becoming more negative. It tends to expand the airways and the alveoli, increases the volume, decreases the pressure, Pressure becomes minus one, lower than the atmospheric pressure. If atmospheric pressure is 760, the airway pressure becomes 759. Air starts coming from outside to inside. Inspiration. Expiration, diaphragm moves upwards. Reduces, it compresses the alveoli and the airways. It reduces their volume, increases the pressure. Pressure becomes plus one instead of, instead of now the pressure in the airway 761 one millimeter higher than the atmospheric pressure, air starts going out of the lungs. So that is what happens. And this air will go from inside to out till the pressure is touches zero. This is your, uh, this is what is happening to the airway pressure, airway pressure or the alveolar pressure during inspiration and expiration. Yes. Now, we've discussed pleural pressure and airway pressure separately. But both the pressures are acting at the same time. 
So we have to see, study both of them together simultaneously. They're both, we, we study them separately, but they are going to both act at the same time. So what happens to the pleural pressure? Pleural pressure is minus 2.5 millimeters of mercury with respect to atmosphere. Plural pressure is, we've already done that. Plural pressure is minus 2.5 millimeters of mercury with respect to atmosphere. And this becomes minus 6 at the end of inspiration and back to minus 2.5 at the end of expiration. So these are the changes which happen in the plural pressure. Plural pressure and the alveolar or the airway pressure, right? Plural pressure or the alveolar pressure. Now, what is the net pressure? Net pressure is net pressure is the difference between these two pressures. The difference between these two pressures is known as the net pressure. Yes, and the net pressure is called the transpulmonary pressure. Transpulmonary pressure, or also known as the transmural pressure, or also known as the distending pressure, transpulmonary pressure, or the transmural pressure, or the distending pressure. This is equal to intrapulmonary minus the intra. What was intrapulmonary? Intrapulmonary is the alveolar or the airway pressure. Alveolar or the airway pressure. Please see this once again. What will happen to the airway pressure? Airway pressure, uh, when, please remember, the easiest way to understand airway pressure is during inspiration, it has to be lower than atmospheric pressure. During expiration, it has to be higher than atmospheric pressure because air always moves from air always moves from a area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. This is during inspiration. During inspiration, because the pressure surrounding the lungs is becoming more negative, increase in the volume of airways and alveoli, decrease in pressure. Pressure becomes minus one with respect to atmosphere. Air comes from outside to inside till the pressure on both sides is the same, till it reaches zero. During expiration, the alveoli and the airways are compressed. Volume reduces, pressure increases. Pressure becomes plus one and air goes from inside to out. That is your alveolar, alveolar or the airway pressure during expiration. Now, I've also told you about pleural pressure. Pleural pressure is minus 2.5 at the, before inspiration, minus 6 at the end of inspiration, back to minus 2.5 at the end of expiration. What is the net pressure? Net pressure is intrapulmonary minus the intrapleural. This is your transpulmonary pressure. Transpulmonary pressure or the transmural pressure or the descending pressure distending the pressure. Now tell me, what is going to be the transpulmonary pressure? What is the transpulmonary pressure? Let's see questions related to this. What is the transpulmonary or the distending pressure? My first question related to this topic, and that is, what is the distending pressure at the end of, what is the distending pressure at the start of inspiration? What is the distending pressure at the start of inspiration? Distending pressure at the start of inspiration. Is it minus 2.5? Is it plus 2.5? Is it minus 6 or is it plus 6 millimeters of mercury? Bolo, minus 2.5. Distending pressure at the start of inspiration. Start of inspiration, what is intrapulmonary pressure? How much is the intrapulmonary pressure? Intrapulmonary pressure is 0. 
at the start of inspiration what is the pleural pressure pleural pressure is minus 2.5 what is 0 minus minus 2.5 this is a plus 2.5 at the start of inspiration, the alveolus is distended with a force of plus 2.5 millimeters of mercury. This is what you mean by distending pressure. Even at the start of inspiration, before you actually bring air into the lungs, the alveolus is distended with a pressure of plus 2.5. Alveolus is not collapsed. At the start of tidal inspiration, before I take in air, the alveolus is distended with a pressure of Yes. My next question, what is going to be the distending pressure? What is the distending pressure at the end of? Distending pressure at the end of inspiration. What is the distending pressure at the end of inspiration? Is it minus 2.5? Is it plus 2.5? Is it minus 6 or is it plus 6 millimeters of mercury? at the end of a tidal inspiration i should say that at the end of a tidal inspiration at the tidal at the end of tidal inspiration how much is intrapulmonary pressure intrapulmonary pressure is zero intrapleural is minus six so it becomes zero minus minus six which is plus six have you understood at the end of inspiration now the alveolus will be distended with a force of plus six, it has expanded, it will be dis distended with a force of plus six millimeters of mercury. Have you understood, right? Start of inspiration, it was the alveolus is distended with a force of plus 2.5. End of inspiration, it is distended with a force of plus six, right? Take another example, let's take another example. Supposing I do a strong inspiratory effort. St supposing I make a strong inspiratory effort. I make a strong inspiratory effort. Plural pressure. Plural pressure is now minus 15 millimeters of mercury. What is the distending pressure? What is going to be the distending pressure? Bulo. What is going to be the distending pressure? I make a strong inspiratory effort. I use my accessory muscles, accessory muscles of inspiration, plural pressure. What is going to be the distending pressure? Distending pressure will be 0 minus minus 15. Cool. Distending pressure will be 0. My, distending pressure at the end of inspiration. At the end of inspiration, this is going to be plus 15 millimeters of mercury. If I make even stronger inspiratory effort, plural pressure is minus 20. Distending pressure will be plus 20, right? This basically tells you stronger the inspiratory effort, stronger the inspiratory effort, stronger the inspiratory effort, more negative is the plural pressure, more negative is the plural pressure. And if plural pressure is more negative, more positive is the transpulmonary is the transpulmonary or the distending pressure. More negative the plural pressure, more positive will be the transpulmonary or the distending pressure. Stronger the inspiratory effort, more negative the plural pressure, more, more negative the plural pressure, the lungs distend with that much more force, right? This, this is the distending. It is the pressure which is helping the alveoli to distend. It is the net pressure, net pressure intrapulmonary minus the intrapleural. Okay, has everybody got this? Please see this graph once again. What has happened here? I've tried to show you both the airway pressure as well. Airway pressure zero before inspiration minus one in early stages of inspiration zero at the end of inspiration plus one early stages of expiration zero at the end of expiration plural pressure minus 2.5 at the start of inspiration minus six at the end of inspiration back to minus 2.5 what is the net pressure it is the difference of these two pressures what are these two pressures intrapulmonary and intrapleural and the difference of these two pressures is known as transpulmonary or the transneural pressure or the distending pressure. What is the distending pressure at the start of a tidal inspiration? Plus 2.5. End of tidal inspiration? Plus 6. 
stronger the inspiratory effort, more negative the plural pressure, more positive will be the distending pressure. And makes so much sense, huh? Stronger inspiratory effort if the, neg if the negative pressure surrounding the lungs becomes even more negative, the lungs will distend with that much more force. Distending pressure will increase, right? No, better. Shrishti Agarwal, please see the diagram in front of you. It is starting, the, the airway pressure is starting at zero. Early stages of inspiration becomes, it, it, it starts at zero, but early stages of inspiration it is becoming minus one. Zero means no airflow. Zero ka matlab kya hai? Airway pressure, atmospheric pressure barabar hai. Koi airflow nahi hai. Inspiration ke samay tab negative hona chahiye na? Airway pressure, tabhi to air bahar se andar aayega. To minus one hua, tabhi air andar aaya. Expiration ke samay ye zyada hona chahiye, plus hona chahiye. Then air will go from inside to out. So please, please see that. Shruti or someone, I, I forgotten the name. Thik hai? Okay. Vasant A, centimeters of water may be uh, the pulmonary, uh, the, the uh, airway pressure is minus one centimeter approximately and plus one centimeter. Same thing, almost. Okay. I was trying to be more emphatic. <laughs> okay, chalo. I think we have we've done this. All right. Next, let's go on to once you've understood the pressures and the questions related to the pressures. Okay. Next, let's have a look at what is the what is the ventilation what is the ventilation perfusion gradient. Are beta plus the transpulmonary pressure is the net pressure as a result of both intrapulmonary and intrapleural. So. At the end of inspiration, this pressure in the alveoli is plus six. It is a distending pressure. Okay. All right. Now, what is the ventilation perfusion gradient? What is the ventilation perfusion gradient in the erect posture? What is the ventilation perfusion gradient in the erect posture? Ventilation perfusion gradient in the erect posture. Please remember in the standing position, ventilation and perfusion are not uniform throughout the lungs. And this is because of the effect of gravity. Right? They are not going to be uniform throughout the lungs. Now, to remember this, a little um, uh, something which you bad, base to apex, base to apex, there is a decrease in base to apex there is a decrease in base to apex there is a decrease in three things and what are these three things base to apex there is a decrease in the intrapleural pressure there is a decrease in the intrapleural pressure there is a decrease in ventilation there is a decrease in perfusion Base to apex, there is a decrease in the intrapleural pressure, there is a decrease in ventilation, and there is a decrease in perfusion. But, but VQ ratio, ventilation perfusion ratio increases from base to apex. VQ ratio increases from base to apex. Base to apex, there is a decrease in this one little line is going to answer so many MCQs. Base to apex, there is a decrease in the intrapleural pressure, ventilation, perfusion, but the VQ ratio increases from base to apex. Please, please remember this is only in the standing position. Why is there going to be the increase in ratio is going to be because the decrease in perfusion is much more, decrease in perfusion is much more than the decrease in ventilation. Have you understood? Base per ventilation zyada hai, apex per kam hai. 
बेस पर परफ्यूशन ज्यादा है एपेक्स पर कम है लेकिन जो वीक्यू रेशियो है दैट इज हायर एट द एपेक्स व्हाई सो बिकॉज़ द डिक्रीज इन डिनोमिनेटर डिक्रीज इन द परफ्यूशन इज मच मोर देन द डिक्रीज इन वेंटिलेशन डिक्रीज इन परफ्यूशन इज मच मोर देन द डिक्रीज इन वेंटिलेशन चंदू base to apex decrease in b base a apex d decrease base to apex <laughs> b base a apex d decrease base to apex decrease in yes all right so this is the uh, now let's try and understand this a little more let's try and do uh, this a little more what is the what is the uh ventilation and perfusion in the standing position in the lungs right please remember this is what happens during standing yes now during standing how much is the ventilation ventilation at the base ventilation at the base is 0.82 liters per minute and perfusion at the base perfusion at the base is 1.29 liters per minute so therefore what will happen to the vq ratio vq ratio is now going to be 0.63 0.63 at the base vq ratio is 0.63 at the base as you go towards the apex the ventilation reduces from 0.82 to 0.2 24 liters per minute perfusion reduces from 1.29 to 0.07 liters per minute right ventilation is reducing from 0.82 to point is reducing from 1.29 to 0.07 a much larger decrease in perfusion so what will happen to the vq ratio vq ratio the apex is 3.3 vq ratio at the apex is 3.3 please remember at the level of the third rib at the level of the third rib third rib is close to the hilum the vq ratio is 1 see this that line which i made you write base to apex there is a decrease in ventilation there is a decrease in perfusion but the vq ratio is increasing from base to apex it is 0.63 at the base and 3.3 at the apex larger decrease in perfusion causes an increase in the vq ratio right now if you remember at right at the uh, right at the beginning of this chapter i told you that the vq ratio if vq ratio is less than 1 there is going to be an incomplete oxygenation of the blood right incomplete oxygenation of the blood at the base the vq ratio is 0.63 so let's now try and see what is going to happen to the uh, po2 and the po2 and the oxygen content po2 in millimeters of mercury PO2, please remember, it refers to the dissolved oxygen. Dissolved oxygen in the plasma. PO2 at the base is eighty-nine millimeters of mercury. At the apex is one thirty-two millimeters of mercury. Higher at the apex, lesser at the base. Why lesser at the base? I told you, VQ ratio less than one, incomplete oxygenation. Right? The oxygen content. oxygen total oxygen content in ml per 100 ml of blood ml per 100 ml ml of blood is 19.2 ml per 100 ml of blood at the base higher at the apex 20 ml per 100 ml of blood higher o2 at the apex high o2 at the apex right if you see the pco2 PCO2 in millimeters of mercury. This is PCO2 in millimeters of mercury. 
42 mm at the apex and 49 millimeters at the base. PCO2 will be higher at the base because of now I told you VQ ratio is less than one. Ventilation is less than the perfusion. So incomplete oxygenation and incomplete of removal. So carbon dioxide is higher at the base. What will happen to the total CO2 content? CO2 content in ml per deciliter. ml per deciliter. Sorry, uh, if you could just change this, this is sorry, 28 here and this is 42 here. So please change this, sorry, I made a mistake. O2 content is 42 ml per 100 ml and 49 ml per 100 ml. So CO2 content at the base 49, less at the apex, higher at the base. PCO2 in millimeters of mercury will be higher at the base and lower at the apex. Lower at the apex. Yes. So this is as far as your. These values you don't need to remember, but you need to understand the concept behind it. Right. So uh, important question. Ventilation more at base, less at apex. Perfusion more at base, less at apex. PO2 VQ ratio higher at apex. PO2 higher at apex. O2 content higher at apex. PCO2 higher at base. CO2 content higher at base. Right? And there is a very cl important clinical implication here. Secondary tuberculosis. What is the site of secondary tuberculosis? Which is the most common site of secondary tuberculosis? Site of secondary tuberculosis, this is going to be the apex because what happens at the apex is the oxygenation. PO2 total oxygen is higher at the apex, isn't it? And you know that mycobacterium, mycobacterium is an aerobic organism, air loving organism. It the, the hematogenous spread will occur to those areas where the PO2 at the total CO, total O2 will be higher. Right? Hematogenous spread of mycobacterium. Yes. Hematogenous spread of mycobacterium. Mycobacterium will be to the apex where the PO2 and the PCO2 is, uh, PO2 and the total O2 is higher. Okay? All right. Okay? Important questions, ventilation more at base, less at apex, perfusion more at base, less at apex, VQ ratio higher at apex, PO2 higher at apex, total O2 higher at apex, PCO2 higher at base, total CO2 higher at base, site of secondary tuberculosis, apex. Why? Higher um, VQ ratio at the apex, more oxygenation of the blood at the apex. Okay. VQ ratio at the third rib is one. Third rib is one. One. What is the average VQ ratio of the lung at the third rib is one. What is the average VQ ratio? Average VQ ratio of the whole lung. Average VQ ratio of the whole lung is a 0 0.8. It is not one. It is slightly lower than one. The average VQ ratio is going to be 0 0.8. Okay. I'll try and put it in one, uh, in one, I don't know whether it helps you. If I put everything in one frame, does it help you? No, it's too small. Too small? Okay. Okay. So this is as far as your uh, ventilation perfusion gradient in the standing posture is concerned. Okay. All right. Let's go on to the next topic. So you can see this in one section. Yes, and this is the other.
Let's go on to the next topic. And the next topic is work done during quiet breathing. Yes, Stuti Agarwal, absolutely right. There is a physiologic dead space at the apex, but only during standing. When you lie down, when you lie down, all the gradients are lost. Okay? All the gradients are lost. Okay? Why is CO2 higher at base, beta? Because the VQ ratio is less than 1. If VQ ratio is less than 1, it means incomplete oxygenation of blood and incomplete removal of carbon dioxide. Have you understood? So CO2 tends to be higher at the base. So let's have a look at let's have a look at work done in quiet breathing. What is work done? Work done in quiet breathing. Now, as far as work done in quiet breathing is concerned, then this is how much is the work done in quiet breathing? The work done in quiet breathing is 0 0.3 to 0 0.8 kg meter per minute. 0 0.3 to 0 0.8 kg meter per minute. Now, two thirds of the work done in quiet breathing is against, two thirds of the work done is against the elastic forces. Two thirds of the work done is against the elastic forces, and one third of the work done is against the resistance forces. Right? Two thirds is against the elastic forces, and one third is against the resistance forces. Now, in the elastic forces, there are two types of elastic forces. There is a surface tension elasticity. There is a surface tension elasticity and there is a tissue elasticity. Surface tension elasticity and tissue elasticity. Now, um, two thirds or 65% of the work done is against elastic forces, out of which 43% of the work done is against surface tension elasticity and 22% of the work done is against tissue elasticity. Right? Or you could write this as 42% and 23%. Right? Resistance forces, resistance forces is about 35% of the work done is against resistance forces. Now, two resistance forces, there is the airway resistance. Airway resistance, 28% of the work done is against airway resistance, and 7% of the work done is against viscous resistance. Viscous resistance, 28% against airway resistance and 7% is against viscous resistance. Viscous resistance means tissue viscosity against tissue viscosity against the air vis viscosity of the air. So that is called viscous resistance. So that means my first important question is maximum work done in quiet breathing. Maximum work done in quiet breathing is against surface tension force yes maximum work done maximum work done in quiet breathing is surface tension force maximum work done in quiet breathing will be against the Maximum work done in quiet breathing is against the surface tension intensity. Yes, this will be against the surface tension. This is quiet breathing. Yes, yes, Shrishti, you will need to know the first, at least approximately, because you have to answer your questions. Question one question has been asked maximum work done in quiet breathing against surface tension. Now, let's have a look at the airway resistance. Right? Airway resistance. Now, when I say airway resistance, now, the question over here is, which airways, which airways have the maximum resistance to airflow? Which airways have the maximum resistance to airflow? Which airways have the maximum resistance to airflow? A, is it going to be the large sized airways? Is it going to be the medium sized airways? Or C, is it going to be 
the small sized airways which airways have the maximum resistance to airflow is it going to be the large sized airways the medium sized airways or the small sized airways now a very interesting this is a very interesting question and this says which airways will have the maximum resistance to airflow? This is going to be the medium-sized airways, not the small-sized airways. The medium-sized airways will have the maximum resistance to airflow. Okay. Now, what is what are these medium-sized airways? Let's try and define them. What are the medium-sized airways? Right. Now, why medium-sized? Why do medium-sized airways have maximum resistance? What are medium-sized airways? That is what I'm going to discuss now. See, if you look at the trachea, trachea smaller bronchi, each will keep dividing into smaller and smaller bronchi. Yes, they will keep dividing into smaller and smaller bronchi. And you get the, this is what is, you get a tracheobronchial tree is formed. So there is something known as the Weber's classification. There is a Weber's classification of the tracheobronchial tree, right? There is a Weber's classification of the tracheobronchial tree. And what is this Weber's classification of the tracheobronchial tree? This tells you, this says generation zero is trachea. Generation zero is trachea. Generations 1 to 16 is the conducting zone. Generation 1 to 16 is the conducting zone. And 17 to 23 is the respiratory zone. 17 to 23, this is known as the Weber's classification of the tracheobronchial tree, which divides the trachea into 23 generations. Generation 0 is the tree. 16 is conducting zone. 17 to 23 is respiratory zone. 3 to 5 generations are the medium sized airways. 3 to 5 generations is medium sized airways. And medium sized airways will show you the maximum resistance to airflow. Medium sized airways will show you the maximum resistance to airflow. So this is your. Uh, tracheobronchial tree. Generation 0 is trachea, 1 to 16 is conducting zone, 17 to 23 is respiratory zone, and 3 to 5 will be the medium-sized airways. So that means if I study this graphically, if I have graphically here, and if I have airway resistance on the y-axis, and I have large medium and the small sized airways large medium and the small sized airways right large sized airways will have a lower resistance higher in the medium sized airways and it reduces in the small sized airways the maximum resistance to airflow will be in the medium sized airways and which are these medium sized airways maximum resistance when i measure the airway resistance it is maximum in the medium sized airways this is seen in the third to the fifth generations. This is your medium sized airways, and these are the ones which are going to show you the maximum resistance to airflow. Not in the large, not in the small. In fact, in the small sized airways, the resistance will decrease. Yes? Now, um, let's try and understand why does this happen. Now, we know that what is the relationship between resistance and radius? Resistance is inverse to the fourth power of radius. Resistance is inverse to the fourth power of radius. Yes. So in the large sized airways, in the large sized airways, are beta me ko explain to karne do. PH, Mimansa, with Nunupur, Ruk Jau. I explain Karim. Abhi I explain Kahan. I have not explained it as yet. Large side, and what is happening in the large side? Remember, resistance is inverse to the fourth power of radius. 
So in the large sized airways, there is a huge increase in the radius. Their radius is very large. So what will the resistance? Resistance now reduces. There is a large, there is a significant decrease in resistance. Why? Because resistance is inverse to the fourth power of radius. So because in the large sized airways, the radius itself is so large, resistance reduces. Resistance is inverse to the fourth power of radius. Okay with that? Okay. So we can explain why the resistance is lower in the large side. But if I use the same principle, then the resistance should be higher in the smaller sized airways. If radius is less, the resistance has to be much more. But when I measure resistance, Shruti, it is 1 upon 4th power of radius, radius to the power 4, okay, radius to the power 4. So if I use the same principle, then the resistance should have been maximum in the small sized airways. But when, um, but when I measure the resistance, resistance is higher in the medium, less in the small sized airways. So there must be an explanation for this. And what is the explanation for this? Let's try and understand. Let's try and compare the medium and the small sized airways. Medium and the small sized airways. Okay, medium and the small. Let's compare. Why is the resistance higher in medium sized airways? First is, let's see what is the total cross-sectional area. What is the total cross-sectional area? Total cross-sectional area is lesser in the medium and higher in the smaller sized areas. Please, please understand the term here is total, not the cross-sectional area of the individual airway, but all the airways of that generation. All airways, total means all airways, total means all airways of that generation. Right? All airways of that generation. The total cross section area is lesser in the mean and higher in the smaller sized airways. Okay? Now, velocity of airflow. Velocity of airflow. The next the next important term is velocity of airflow. Now, velocity of airflow is inverse to the total cross-sectional area. So, velocity of airflow will be higher in the medium-sized airways and lower in the smaller-sized airways. Please understand two important points. I said total cross-sectional area is lesser in medium, higher in smaller-sized airways. Total. That means all airways of one generation, if you add them together, the cross-sectional area will be higher in the smaller sized airways, lower in the medium sized airways. Now, velocity of airflow, what is the relationship of velocity and total cross-section area? Velocity is inverse to the total cross-section area. So velocity is higher in the medium and lower in the smaller sized airways. Then the next important point is tendency for turbulence. Tendency for turbulence. You know, there are two types of, there are two types of flow. There is a turbulence and laminar flow. So tendency, for, wherever velocity is higher, flow becomes turbulent. Tendency for turbulent is more in medium, less in small sized airways. More the velocity, turbulent airflow. There is going to be a turbulent airflow. Higher the velocity, higher will be the higher will be greater will be the tendency for tur turbulence. If turbulence increases, resistance to airflow will increase. Turbulent airflow means greater resistance to airflow. So the reason why there is a higher resistance to airflow in the medium-sized airways is because of a higher velocity of airflow in medium-sized airways. Greater tendency for turbulent, which increases the resistance to airflow. 
a classroom. This is this is the reason why there is going to be a uh, uh, higher resistance to airflow in medium-sized airways. Now, please understand. Resistance does not only depend upon radius. Resistance is also determined by the pattern of flow. More turbulent the flow, greater will be the resistance. I can't stop. In large sized airways, what is overwhelming factor? What is the most important factor is the large radius. So resistance reduces. In medium-sized airways, what is increasing the resistance to flow is going to be the turbulent flow. Why is it turbulent? It is turbulent because of a greater velocity. Why is the velocity higher in medium-sized airways? Because of a lesser total cross-sectional area. I found story. This is why, right? Uh, Darshan Agarwal, no. Ye ek principle hai physics ka. Velocity of airflow is inverse to the total cross-sectional area. I found story. Total cross-sectional area. Okay? See, when I say total cross-sectional area, what do I mean by that? See, an airway is dividing into smaller airways. It is dividing into smaller and smaller airways. So what is happening to the total cross-sectional area? If I see the total cross-sectional area here, it is lesser. Here, it is more. In the smaller sized airways, the total cross-sectional area will increase and velocity is related to the total cross-sectional area. Velocity is inverse to the total cross-sectional area. Right? Yeah, so at Jennifer, larger airways, what is the overwhelming factor? Overwhelming factor is the large radius. There, the pattern of flow is not the important factor. Important factor there is radius. Here in the medium-sized airways, what is the more important factor is the turbulent airflow rather than the radius. Okay? Resistance of all the medium-sized airways combined together is less than... No, not less, beta. Resistance of medium-sized airways is higher, na? Higher than the smaller sized airways? Adarsh, in the trachea, the overwhelming factor is the radius. Overwhelming factor is the radius. Radius is more important for the larger sized airways. Pattern of flow. Turbulent airflow is the most uh, factor in the medium and small sized airways. Okay? Chalo. Okay. Yes. We will be doing this concept again in cardiovascular system next time and that will be able to explain this you will be able to understand this better okay so these are principles of um, hemodynamics principles of flow which we discuss again okay i want to take a little break 10 minute break okay and we could be the class is so break for 10 minutes We resume at 8.10 p.m. Class till 10 p.m. Gracias.